Here with us to discuss the importance and process of blood donation in the Federation is Dr. Jensen Morton, Director of Health Institutions within the Ministry of Health. Good morning, Dr. Morton, and welcome to Good Morning SCM. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, pleasure, indeed. So let's get right to it. Why do we need to do donate blood? What is the importance of it? All right. Well, blood donation is something that all citizens of any country should be aware of. We need blood, of course, because for a multitude of reasons in which it's medically indicated, you would need different blood products, usually in order to save a life or to decrease symptoms of um, another ailment, whilst we treat an underlying cause, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the main reasons why persons may require blood donation in send kits would be um, a lot of times, if there's a large car accident, major laceration, some super um, traumatic event, maybe loss of a limb, maybe um, stab wound, gunshot wound, apart from those, it could be something else like symptomatic um, uterine fibroids, um, exceptionally heavy um, menstrual bleeding in which it's been occurring for a very long period of time. Um, usually, if there's a C-section, um, there is a significant amount of blood loss. And then the other indications would be persons with some chronic ailments, maybe a chronic anemia, um, maybe certain types of cancers and um, certain aspects of kidney disease. And all of these persons, um, and persons with sickle cell anemia as well, all of these persons, at some point in time, they may require um, a blood donation to assist in treating their ailment. Wow. Right, just a follow-up question. You mentioned uh, blood products. Uh, yes. I'm trying to understand whether, you know, it's... A blanket statement blood is in the blood product itself or are you actually extracting certain components of the blood well when we extract um, a unit of blood it comprises of different things it comprises the red blood cells it comprises white blood cells it comprises platelets and um, it also comprises plasma and blood proteins um, what we do is using centrifugation and other um, other methods of filtration, we can separate them into different products such that depending on what your specific complaint is, that you can get the specific product um, that you need. So for most persons, um, if it's something traumatic or if there's been any acute blood loss, they tend to get um, red blood cells just to assist with the oxygenation. But if there's an issue with the blood clotting, the person might require um, platelets and if it's um, another issue in which um, it's decreased blood volume and other things, it might require um, what we call fresh frozen plasma, which is another um, component after we um, treat it accordingly. Oh, Sorry, wow. just a follow-up question. Since we're talking about these uh, products, is there a shelf life associated with uh, these? Products? There's definitely a shelf life. It's one of the reasons why um, in any nation, a single blood drive um, is not sufficient. You have to continuously be advocating for blood donation because the red blood cells, they last usually in the region of four to five weeks only. So that means that even if we do one major blood drive and 200 people come forth, it doesn't really help that much. It has to be basically a slow and steady, continuous, controlled input to match the output. Um, the fresh frozen plasma could last a while, could last a few months. Um, platelets don't last long at all. But the good news is that um, they are the easiest to um, acquire. So it kind of plays very well. But the main component, the red blood cells, it only lasts between four and five weeks, wow. optimally. Oh, wow. That's a short time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what are some of the requirements for donating blood? We can begin with the age range. Okay, well, the age range that we ask for is between 18 and 65. But nowadays, it tends to mostly be 62 because if you're suffering from certain chronic ailments, we tend to give you a chance. Um, the other things would be when you are on certain medications, um, you actually can't give blood in the acute setting. It's either you have to stop the medication for a certain period of time, but in some instances, if you are on the medication at all, you just cannot um, donate the blood. Sometimes some people, a, a big misunderstanding, some people think that persons um, that are diabetic and insulin can donate, but no, it's, it's, well, if you're diabetic, you can donate, but not if you're on insulin, especially specific types. Um, but you can, you technically can, if you are not on insulin. Um, the other main medication that's a contraindication would be blood thinners, because they mess with everything with regards to aspects of coagulation and blood proteins. Um, but 
when you come and you explain to us all of the medications that you're on, we would tell you whether you're able to donate or not. And even if you missed one, we still do our own screening just to make sure that there's none of these components in the bloodstream. Um, the other things, um, of course, um, if you're suffering from certain ailments that can be trans that can be um, spread from the blood, of course you can't, but even if you're unaware, we do our own screening again. So the blood donation, you can nearly say that you can use it as a form of checking yourself because we're gonna check for everything and we're going to let you know if by chance there's something that you didn't know. Um, and apart from that, um, you have a few other asterisks. Uh, there are some precautions that we take regarding if you would have traveled to specific countries in the past three months, places where malaria is endemic, like um, certain parts of South America and um, Equatorial Africa, we will tell you wait a three months because sometimes you can be completely asymptomatic and you wouldn't know and we don't want to, again, um, run the risk of that. Um, and the other thing that's a, a big one would be persons with tattoos and piercings. Um, normally we ask persons if you've recently had a tattoo or piercing to wait um, some places say three months but we tend to more go closer to six months again that's a, there's a slight risk of um, acquiring hepatitis from anything involving um, needles that's not in a medical setting so just in case you're the one unlucky one in 10,000 we don't want it to be that in our attempts to save someone they get something we do our own screening like we yes. say but just to be doubly safe, we also would say if you recently had a tattoo or piercing, wait the six months because at least by that time, if anything happened, if you're the first case of that in Zen kids, at least um, it would show by that time. But like I said, we still do our own screening. I want to go back to the diabetic setting. Yes. You said they can have diabetes and still give blood? If they're not on insulin, yes. So. And if their blood sugar is controlled, all of that. <laughs> oh, so, so for those folks that are on metformin, they can give blood? You can, but you would, again, it's a similar thing. You'd have to stop the medication at a particular time, which we would indicate to you. Oh, wow, okay. And also, like I said, the blood sugar has to be controlled. Similarly, with certain pressure medications, the blood pressure also has to be controlled. Wow, okay. But in the, in the ideal setting, you know, we tend to say, find a young person, Usually we would say if you could find um, a young male, women can give, but because women menstruate on a monthly basis, sometimes their blood count is very close to um, the anemic level. Okay. Um, but even though that is the case, women can still give because they have the inbuilt ability to tolerate a decreased blood count better than the male, even though the male blood count can be higher. So we tend to say that if you are a young male, usually in between 18 and 30, blood count usually super high, you're active, um, no recent tattoo, that's usually the, the people that we aim for. Mm -hmm. But anyone, um, once you fit the other criteria, you can give. So we don't go out of our way to find the persons that are like diabetic and hypertensive to harass them. We tend to find other persons first. Mm -hmm. All right, so how frequently can someone give blood? And I, I assume, listening to you right now, that that might depend on the level that you've assessed that they have. Um, you can give blood up to every three months. Uh, you can safely give up to every three months. It's just the internal mechanics of the body. When we take one unit, the body can manufacture the equivalent of one unit in about three months' time. And that's also the, the lifespan of, um, of a red blood cell. So in about, one month, in about three months' time, sorry, we check and everything's okay. There have been some cases in some areas in which emergently someone would have given in less than three months but the blood count is still okay and they take a risk. I don't think we've ever had to do that. Okay. Mm. So let's talk about where the extension of the opening hours for persons who mm -hmm. can and are willing to donate blood at this time. Well, this, is, this has to be explained very specifically. Um, the opening hours, if you went back a few years, the opening hours used to be between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. Um, it was shortened to 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. just, again, a few years back. Uh, that was a bit inconvenient for quite a few people because a lot of times they would get um, the call to donate and it would be difficult for them to be able to leave work earlier than very close to the ending time. So they tended to come usually like around 3, between 2 and 4, and that's when the blood bank would be closed. So then we said we'd extend the hours from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. and we'd also increase the level of organization such that 
if someone is in dire need of a blood product, if you're in dire need of it, and it coincides with the fact that in our existing blood bank, we don't have any blood, excuse me, we don't have any blood, um, let's say red blood cells that match that blood group. But you know your blood group, you have a donor, you absolutely need it, and we don't have it. We have the mechanics in place such that that can be arranged and the staff will accommodate, even if it's nighttime or weekends, but it has to be that specific um, setup. Um, if it is clinically determined that even though this person needs a blood product, but it's one in which we realize that you know it's not acutely dropping, etc., we might still, for the sake of convenience of everyone, we might still come with an alternative um, regime and tell the people, you know, you can return at X Y Z time. Not to say we are chasing anyone, but if someone is in dire need of it, um, as clinically determined by the consultant managing the person, if it's dire need and it cannot wait, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and it coincides with us not having it in the bank, that is when we will say, okay, we'll work out something. Okay. Right, speaking to what you have in the bank right now, is there any uh, thing that is perhaps low in stock? Nothing right now is low in stock, you know, but we always like to keep um, O negative blood on hand because that is the blood group that can basically be given to a multitude of other groups. So if you come in, <clears throat> if you come in in the acute setting and you just got shot or something and we need blood no 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 we don't have time to wait for everything else we would just use the O negative since we wouldn't know your group offhand so because that one is so useful and also um, persons if you're having certain issues with your immune system you could react even sometimes with your own blood group even more so than an O negative since it has less um, antigens on the outside yeah. so we have some other uses for the O negative as well so we tend to use it more than the rest so that is the one that we can never get enough of and we're always asking the persons but what tends to happen is that um when persons randomly come and they randomly donate if they realize that they're o negative and we realize that they're o negative we kindly ask them to register you know give us your information register etc we explain to them the importance and from time to time they might get a call from us to come and to donate so some of the o negative people they know because we tend to be calling them quietly um, at different points during the year. But if we can get um, regular donations from the entire population, it would kind of decrease the, the need for that level of harassment because I mean, we have 50, no, we have 50,000 people here. Um, in a week's time, we probably would only use somewhere in the region of about, in a bad week, like 30 units. So there are enough persons that are healthy enough to donate such that we, should not have um, the issues. It's just that people need to be aware. And what I found is that it's not that people don't want to donate or they're afraid of needles or this and that. It's usually just that it's something that's not on their mind. Okay. And when you call them and tell them, that's when they remember. Or if a family member of theirs needs something, that's when they remember. Usually, um, well, we're trying to see if we could have that stop with regular donations. But usually, you would see someone who put out a distress call to say, if this person has this type of blood, if they could donate, the response is usually very good. And usually the person probably needed one or two units and like eight, nine people show up to donate. So the response is usually good. So that tells me that people don't mind donating. It's just that they just need the reminder that before waiting for an emergency, you could, in the normal setting, just get accustomed to donating. It doesn't have to be every three months. If it's as little as once a year, or once every two years, um, it can help significantly with everything that we're doing. Okay, some concerns persons might have. Is there a blood test before you give the blood? Mm -hmm. There are some tests that we do. Before, you, before we take blood from you, we check your blood count okay. to make sure that it's within a healthy range because we don't want to take blood from you when you need it yourself. Um, we check your blood group as well. So. Once you go to donate, it's like you're getting a free testing of your blood group, essentially. Because of, yes. outside of that setting, the blood group testing has a, has a cost attached. Yes. And um, after we do those two things, and we do um, some screening with regards to questions, once everything adds up and we realize that there's nothing that's a red flag that tells us maybe not now, that's when we um, take the blood product from you, and then we check, we make sure you're okay in between, we make sure you're okay afterwards, we check your blood pressure before, we check all those things before, all your vitals okay. before, we then check them afterwards to make sure that you're stable, and then after we observe you for 
A few minutes to an hour, if you realize that you are okay, we can allow you to leave. We even give you a malt to top back up your, <laughs> your blood volume, your glucose, etc. Okay. And your B vitamins. Okay. And um, that's usually the, the process. And then we take the blood for our own um, screening now to make sure that everything else is okay. Okay. All right. So how do people uh, get in touch with uh, the Ministry of Health if they have questions about donating blood? If they have any question about blood donation, they can call the lab uh, well they can call the hospital and be directed to the lab um the lab manager can answer questions the head of the lab can answer questions the secretary um who also functions as a blood bank advocate can also answer questions but if you stumble on any health professional that works in the hospital they should be able to at least answer your questions or point you in the right direction for you to get those questions answered you can also even speak to persons who have donated blood before because they tend to be, if they're frequent donors, they tend to be very well educated about it. Mm -hmm. And what would that number be if we need to call the blood bank? Four six, oh, the normal, four, six, five, two, five, two, one. Okay, okay. The, okay. the normal number for okay, everything. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. And could you remind, <clears throat> my voice is going, could you remind those persons who are interested in donating blood to open in hours of the lab? Yes, the blood, the blood bank, it's open Monday to Friday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. But as I said, if there's a dire emergency that coincides with us not having the available blood group that's needed, and it's determined that the person needs blood emergently, then the staff of the blood bank, they would be available to accommodate that situation just to ensure that everyone gets what they need.